Welcome to Cultivate, a Veritas Academy podcast, where we explore truth, beauty, and goodness through meaningful conversation. We invite you to join us in discussions meant to edify your mind, encourage your heart, and equip your family to live abundantly in Christ. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Cultivate. I'm Ty Fisher, your host, and we have a real treat today. One of the pillars of Veritas Academy, who is now in the math department at Cairn University, Dale Siegenthaler, formerly the head of the math department here at Veritas Academy, is here. Dale, thanks for thanks for coming down from Philadelphia. I'm thrilled to be here. I Dale is um, sort of legendary around Veritas. Anytime there's a weird tradition here at Veritas. Oftentimes, Mr. Siegenthaler had some kind of involvement in it. He's the one that's come closest, even though he's in the math department, not the science department, to burning the building down on a Chinese lantern experiment. Um, But today, we're here to talk about the beauty of mathematics. Now, don't turn the podcast off. I know that some of you might be a little scared of mathematics, but you, you're scared because you didn't have a teacher like Dale or like Rhonda Forbes or other math teachers here at Veritas. So, Dale, as we get into this, tell me, what is mathematics? So, before we started recording this podcast, I was meeting with John Speed, a Veritas Academy student here, and he had been in the classroom when I was teaching his class sixth grade. And I would teach all of the sixth graders an answer to that question. So if, if you had to say what mathematics is in one word, what would it be? What would you say, Ty? I'm just Golly. curious. Mathematics is numbers. Mathematics is about numbers. It's certainly. about numbers. And that's a lot more. A, well, that's why I asked you the so question, because I don't know the answer. I, I, would, I would teach the sixth graders to say a language. And then if they were allowed to use two words, John Speed gave the correct answer. I said, John, what is mathematics? And he said, it's a beautiful language. Very good. You were paying attention in sixth grade. Oh. And then I described to him him how I've undergone sort of what I can only describe as a mathematical conversion over the past year. And (laughs) and I I still believe that mathematics is a beautiful language, but this is the it was it was the closest to a mathematical conversion that I could experience. And with every head bowed and every eye closed. And I've described this to some of my Christian friends, and they look at me like well, of course, you should believe that because you're a Christian. But this question, what is mathematics, has a variety of different answers amongst mathematicians. There are books written on this question, and this is a question people have wondered about for millennia. So I would always say mathematics is a beautiful language, and that is still certainly an aspect of mathematics. But the way that I describe mathematics for the last year of my life, and I think I'm going to stick to this, is that Mathematics is an immaterial world created by God for us to explore. Okay. Now, it's an immaterial world, an immaterial world, not the immaterial world. What is the, what do you think would be the fabric of this world? The what is mathematics made up of? Mathematics is made up of quantities. I don't know, numbers? It's, it's made up of truth. So truths about quantities, okay. truths about qualities, and a very specific type of truth truth that comes from other truth, kind of the definition of deduction. Okay. Anytime, anytime you have a true statement, it does not have to be about numbers or shapes. Anytime you have a true statement and then you say, what else must be true from this statement? You're doing deduction and you're doing mathematics. That's what mathematicians do. The heart of mathematics is truth. That's what mathematics is all about. And it should be obvious to Christians that all truth has its origin in some way in the one true triune God. And so that's why we have to say that the, the truth that we are exploring in mathematics is a creation. It is part of God's creation, not certainly not his material creation, but part of his immaterial creation. So, so say the definition again, and, yeah. and, and then say why, why you made the conversion. So my definition of mathematics is mathematics is an immaterial world of truth created by God for us to explore so that we might glorify and enjoy him. Okay. Now, how do we explore the world of mathematics? We think about it. We think about it and we write about it and we practice facts about it and we write equations. So the language of mathematics, we use the language to access this world of truth. 
that God has created. And this language that we use to access it is sometimes scary looking to people. And it's riddled with inconsistencies like any language created by man would be. So the symbols, the language, the equations, the way that we write mathematics is, and I would still die on this hill, is certainly not a creation of God that we are discovering. We don't go out into the woods and turn over a stone and find the Cartesian plane. Mm. But the, the truths that the Cartesian plane can represent must be created by God. We create the language to access the truth in this world. So what, so what makes that immaterial world beautiful? I mean, this is one of the things that, you know, we have, we have a lot of students here at Veritas that go, that go pretty deep into math. John is, John Speed, who was mentioned earlier, he's actually even a year in front of our normal pace here at Veritas. But what, what I really enjoyed as a dad is that my daughters, even the ones that were going into majors in the humanities and things like that, you know, they, they learn to love mathematics. So why is math beautiful? So some other things that people automatically would be comfortable saying are beautiful are poetry or paintings or maybe to use a different type of beauty, delicious, when they're talking about a meal. So is math and delicious? I, I, well, yes. And I remember having a conversation with Ned Bustard several years ago. He was editing a book on beauty, and he was asking me if there should be a chapter on mathematics. I'm like, of course there should be a chapter on mathematics. If I or anybody that has experienced the, the beauty of mathematics was going to pick up a book about beauty and flip through the table of contents, and there's, there is not at least one, maybe half of the book is about mathematics, for say... It, this book is really an imperfect treatment of beauty. They're missing out a, a whole bunch of it. So how is that beauty experienced? I think, and this doesn't necessarily tie itself to an age of student. I think that most people need to go through the grammar stages of the beauty of mathematics. So you, you first see the beauty of mathematics in things like patterns and tangible things you can pick up and hold, maybe three-dimensional polyhedrons, which I spent a lot of time because of the beauty and the symmetry that they could represent. And then at the next level, at the logic level, you can there is a beauty that is in, a, in an elegant argument. Mm -hmm. So if we go back to the analogy of mathematics as a world, the Pythagorean theorem is a true statement in this world. And if we say, well, the Pythagorean theorem is like a waterfall in this world of mathematics. And how do you experience the beauty of a waterfall? You can climb up a mountain that's some distance away from it, and you can look at it from that angle. Or you can stand at the base of the waterfall and look up and, and feel the water splashing you in the face. Or you can climb up to the top of the hill where the water, waterfall is and look over its edge. There's probably something about the waterfall that you could experience by going over the waterfall in a boat or something like that. <laughs> so the the... There are hundreds of different proofs of the Pythagorean theorem, and most great mathematical theorems have many, many different proofs that have been created to demonstrate that truth. And one of the things that mathematicians like to do, and that I think that 7th and 8th grade students with a little bit of logic can do, is look at these arguments and decide which one of these, which one of these proofs is more beautiful, which one of them is more elegant. And then at the, at the rhetoric level of enjoying the beauty of mathematics, I would think of it like delighting in a, a great feast. Bertrand, a feast? Feast. Bertrand Russell, when he was talking about mathematics, <laughs> Bertrand Russell is probably not somebody that we quote often on no, Veritas podcast. Uh, yeah, not, not, as, not as often. And Bertrand Russell said that the beauty of mathematics is cold and austere, like a sculpture. Mm. He talked about when he was a young child and started studying Euclid's elements with his brother, he said it was the most fantastic event of his life, as dazzling as first love, and he had never imagined, and he was speaking as like an 11-year-old, that there was anything so delicious in the whole world as the, the delight that he was having in the beauty of the arguments that Euclid was presenting. Isn't that, isn't that quick? Because I know that you, when you were teaching geometry here, really focus on Euclid's elements. So you were trying to give the kids a taste of that delight, a mm -hmm. taste of that deliciousness. Correct. And I think that's something that every human should get to experience and delight in. Yeah. And I know Aristotle agrees with me. 
Plato <laughs> agrees with me. So th this is the highest form of knowledge. It is knowledge itself. Plato well, said that you are unworthy of the, the title human if you don't know that the diagonal of a square is incommensurable with the side of the square. That's, that's great. I, I think I believe that. <laughs> I'd have to work through it. So you're talking about mathematics as this immaterial world that we get to explore and find truth in that God has created. So, but we know that many mathematicians, I mean, you just mentioned Bert, Bertrand Russell, not a believer, not a believer in the triune God, not a believer in Jesus. So is math the same or is it different for Christians and non-Christians? Are there two maths? No, there's definitely only one math. And so if, if you ask the question, is mathematics the same experience for Christians or non-Christians? We'll talk about that, and the answer is definitely no. But in the same way that a non-Christian and a Christian heart surgeon could work together on the same patient and have the same outcome, or in the same way that a Christian and a non-Christian house builder could work together on the same house and construct the same building given a set of plans— I think that a Christian and a, and a non-Christian mathematician could work together just fine on, on proving the same mathematical theorem. Hmm. However, the way that they approach that truth and what they do with the truth at the, in the end would be very different. When I thought about the question, is mathematics the same or different for Christians and non-Christians, I thought, well, is, is eating the same for Christians and non-Christians? Is feasting the same for Christians and non-Christians? And in some sense, the answer is... They're, uh, they're, no, they're involved. The in, they're involved in the same process. We they pick up the same fork, eat the same food, chew on our chew on our steak the same way, but our response to that steak is very, very different. And we can respond as we are studying mathematics with thankfulness and wonder and joy. I have I have listened to some mathematical presentations from some mathematicians recently about mathematical truths that are not new to them, but they were new to me. And I was struck, I'm, I'm assuming that these men that I was listening to are not Christians, not because they're mathematicians, because I know a little bit more about them in personal life. And their response to the mathematical truths that they were presenting was, and I was blown away by the beauty of the, the, the truths they were presenting. But they said, now, I wonder if we could take this, you know, take this proof in digital form and send it out into the solar system, outside of our solar system, into the vast universe, if an alien species encountered this truth, would they know that there is intelligence on in, in our little corner of the universe? Would they know, oh, the, the humans down on Earth have discovered pi now or something like that? Mm -hmm. Whereas I, th I thought, what a sad response that is. Like, we have this truth, and I just want to say, I want to laugh. That's what I, I want to laugh at the joy and the beauty that is in this truth. I want to tell other people about it so they can experience the same beauty and truth and give thanks to the God who is the author of that truth. Yeah. So, so have, have you actually had times in your life when you discover some truth and it really moves you devotionally? Y yes, certainly. That's wonderful. Yeah. The, I guess as a, as a side story, I became a morning person when I was a college student. Instead of doing my homework late at night as a typical college student was, I would get up early in the morning. Partially it was because I was married during college and my wife and I would go to bed at the same time and I would set the alarm about three hours earlier than I wanted to so I could get up and do my homework. And I would get up and read my Bible and then move to the three or four math problems that I had that were due that day. And it, it turned into this kind of mathematical devotional time period that I've continued. I'm not as consistent in that as I am in my daily Bible morning readings, but I recommend a little bit of recreational mathematics for everybody with their morning coffee. That's good. That's good. And, and, and there's, there's, there have been several times where I have stood in front of a classroom and looked at what I had written on the board and just started laughing out loud because of how, not because of how funny it is, but because of how how profound this truth is that, that we can know this and we can we can mm. delight in it and we can give thanks for it. So at classical Christian schools, we celebrate not just the functionality of math. We we should be celebrating and enjoying that that beauty of mathematics. Why do you think that that maybe that should be even more true at a classical Christian school? then it should be just a regular school someplace. I think classical Christian schools like to emphasize the, the transcendentals, truth, goodness, and beauty. 
And I, th I believe that most people out there, when confronted with mathematics and told to put it in one of those categories, truth uh, of being true, of being good, or being beautiful, I think most of them would put it in the good category. You, okay. can, you can balance your checkbook with it. You can build strong bridges with it. It's like a functional tool. It's a very right? functional tool. The, so the goodness of mathematics, I don't think, needs much defense. But the truth and the beauty of mathematics are certainly there. And since those are at the foundation of what classical Christian schools are about studying, we make room for them in our curriculum. So y you were talking about math and about Aristotle saying that you're not really a fully formed human. You don't, you don't, shouldn't get to get that moniker of human being if you don't, if you don't know these facts about mathematics. Why is math so important to being a fully formed human being because that's like in a classical education we talk about the seven liberal arts the in the quadrivium you know many of them that's kind of mathematical arts why is that so important so we are made we are made in god's image and god is the creator of all things and part of what i have noticed and try and emphasize about what it means to be made in god's image is that we can create we are sub creators mm -hmm. When we think about creating things, we tend to think of building something with our hands or painting something or composing music. But mathematicians, the thing that they are creating is a pattern of ideas. They are, now before it sounds like I'm doubling back on my creation versus discovering of mathematics, we are creating paths to get to these truths, to demonstrate these truths that, that, are, that are there in the most beautiful way. They're sitting there whether we whether we take the path or not, right? Correct, correct. And mathematic, in some sense, is the most creative discipline that there is because we are not limited to a color palette or words of a language or construction materials. We are given the complete freedom of truth, just ideas. So, so that Im immateriality of this mathematical world really frees you up in some ways to discover truths that that you can't discover in other ways. Is that what you're saying? Yes, it is. There's a great book written by a mathematician, a contemporary mathematician, Francis Sue, called Mathematics for Human Flourishing, which mm -hmm. I recommend that everybody would read. He really touches on this idea about why we study mathematics. It is not just because of the functionality of mathematics, but we study mathematics for the same reason that we, we read a good fictional book. Hmm. We, can, we can converse with each other about the characters of Middle Earth, and we should be able to, as humans, converse with each other about proofs of the Pythagorean theorem. Yeah, actually, when you talked about it being an immaterial world, I started thinking of Middle Earth, mm -hmm. right? And Middle Earth is an immaterial world created by J.R.R. Tolkien. Mathematics is an immaterial world not created by Tolkien and not created by Isaac Newton and not created by Plato, but created by God. And then, so it's a very unique immaterial world. Wow. You know, th uh, thank you for, for sharing these insights. I should say that the, the word world was, that word was shared with me by John Kaus. We were talking about mathematics one John day. John Kaus, a former teacher here at Veritas. Correct. We, we were having this conversation, and he sent me this text where he said, yeah, mathematics is a world, is an immaterial world that God created. And just seeing that word, world, connected to mathematics for the first time, I point to as what God used for my mathematical conversion. Wow. That's where the, that's where the Holy Spirit changed your heart Correct. right there. So, thank you, John. There you go. So, but... So th it's wonderful to talk about this, the beauty of mathematics and the truth that we discover. But a lot of people hate mathematics. Well, and of course, here at a classical Christian school, we don't just want our students to do things. We want them to love things. We, we want, you know, what I tell our teachers when we're training them is, if you get your students to love the thing that you're teaching to them, it's not work. It's not work for them to do it, and, and they'll do it much better. So uh, how do we help children learn to love and see the beauty of mathematics and maybe their, their parents as well, even if their parents weren't really great at mathematics? So I've had, I've had a lot of people in my career teaching mathematics come up to me and they say, wow, my son or daughter really loves learning mathematics from you. Like you do such a good job teaching mathematics. And I say, thank you. All I need to do to 
allow people to experience the joy of mathematics is just let mathematics speak for itself. Mm-hmm. I show them mathematics and the response of anybody should be, wow, that's, that's amazing. Now, in order to share the truth of mathematics winsomely and correctly in a way that produces awe and wonder, you, you can't bog it down with, there's an awful lot of ugly mathematics curriculum that gets, gets in the way of the truth and beauty of mathematics. And so my recommendation to parents would be not, not to get in the way of the beauty of mathematics. And I think the most damaging thing that parents do and that many people that I am friends with and I encounter on a regular basis do is they're part of this, they are part of this club with a huge membership that has university presidents in it and politicians in it and powerful people in the world in it and doctors and lawyers and garbage men in it. And it's the, I'm proud of being bad at math club. And so a student comes up to their father and asks for math homework and he glances at it and says, Oh, I remember when I had to be in math class. That was horrible. I don't remember any of this. This you're is never, hard. You're never going to use this again. You're never going to use this again. They say you're going to. Why do you have to study this? This is hard. Or you, they might not, hopefully, if they are thoughtful Christian parents, they're not going to speak badly of the content that's being taught in the school. But they will at least ag- acknowledge that they are bad at it. They can't help them with it. And they're not ashamed of that at all. And so I, would, I was thinking about this question in preparation for the podcast and thought, well, this podcast is being recorded a couple of days before Lent begins. And we like to jokingly in our culture now say, oh, what are you giving up for Lent? Chocolate or dessert or whatever it might be. You should give up saying bad things about mathematics (laughs) for Lent. And and that will help your kids probably more than anything. So, so there's that getting rid of the negative, right? Because that, that is so hard if a parent or a teacher runs down the subject matter. So so getting that getting that out of the way is maybe moving the most important obstacle, but that's that's not going to cause love. Correct. So how do you get cuz what we want to get to is that point where our students love it. And in order to love mathematics as an adult, I think that you that you need to do some work. You don't need to go sign up for a college class or come back to high school and take calculus. But there are some excellent, fun-to-read resources that are out there. There's some excellent YouTube channels full of beautiful mathematical truths that can be enjoyed by adults, and I would recommend looking into those. I'll give you some examples. There's a mathematician named William Dunham who teaches at Muhlenberg College that has written a lot of popular-level mathematics books. Two of my favorite, there's one called The Mathematical Universe, which we used at a history and philosophy of math class that was taught at Veritas Academy. He's also written a book called Journey Through Genius, which he picks 10 of the, in his estimation, his 10 most favorite mathematical theorems, walks you through the history of them, actually walks you through the proof of them, and then there's usually an epilogue in each chapter where he talks about the, the different parts of mathematics that were affected by this proof mm. and sometimes other proofs and gets into the personalities as well. Um, some YouTube channels, there, there's a wonderful channel called Number File, which is number, P-H-I-L-E, lover of numbers. Vi Heart has some wonderful mathematics YouTube videos. And Three Blue, One Brown is a wonderful mathematics channel that has video series on a summary of calculus. Here's what calculus is all about, even though you don't have, you don't have to take calculus or understand calculus to appreciate the beauty in these videos. Well, one of the things that you brought here to Veritas and one of the, the parts of Dale Siegenthaler that's still around Veritas Academy, especially as we think about Shrove Tuesday and, and stuff. We have some house competitions, and one of our houses is named after Leonard Euler. So why, tell us a little bit about Euler, and why were you so fascinated with him that you convinced one-fourth of our secondary school to be in a house dedicated to him? So... I have a lot of friends that know that I like Leonard Euler. There's this guy named Euler that Dale likes. And I, and I think, and you even said it yourself, Ty, you brought this to Veritas Academy, and I'm very happy that I did. I think I should bring it everywhere I go, the, the goodness of the life of this man, Leonhard Euler. But I want to say at the outset, this is not a, a pet hobby of mine or somebody that 
It's just his little interest and nobody else cares about it. I've had a couple of friends that as they have grown in their mathematical interests, start reading other math books and encountering other mathematicians. And Euler is prominent in all in all of these things. I'm like, oh, I thought this was just that guy that that Dale liked. That is certainly not who Euler is. But let me tell you why I like him. So a good way of thinking about Euler, place in history, is he was born and died about the same time as Benjamin Franklin. Okay. Except he was on the the European continent. He was born in Switzerland, then moved to Russia, back to Germany, and then back to Russia again. As a quick summary, and he lived in the 18th century, which is sometimes referred to as the golden age of mathematics. Mm. You could look up a list of mathematicians who were working in the 1700s, and it's literally hundreds of mathematicians long. And they might not be names that everybody recognizes, but they are names that are going to show up in physics and calculus. And part of the reason why it was a golden age is this was only about 50 years after calculus had really come onto the scene as, mm-hmm. a, as a powerful uh, powerful new mathematical tool. So we're, we're dealing with the golden age of mathematics and Euler's con- contributions during the golden age of mathematics make him seem like the only mathematician that was working during that time. Mm-hmm. He wasn't, but one statistic which puts it in, uh, in context for most people is that he wrote 800 pages of mathematics per year for his entire career of 60 years. So he's publishing in mathematics from the ages of 16 to 76 that's 48,000 pages of mathematics. Most people would have a hard time writing 48,000 pages of prose or poetry. Well, of course, he did that on his laptop. Right, right. right. And that, that's a good segue to we're, we're getting closer and closer to why Euler is such an important person for all of us to have on the top of our list of heroes is that Euler was blind. He wasn't blind from birth, but he lost sight in one eye in his 20s and his second eye in his 50s. And his productivity in mathematics actually went up as a result of that. He because was, his mind is moving through that immaterial world. Correct. His mind is moving through that world. And he, is, he had the help of scribes that would read letters and write things. And he would describe what's going on in that world to them. And they would keep his correspondence up. But for the last 20 years of his life... He could not read or write. I think he could, he could see well enough to get around his, his home and maybe recognize his children if they were up close to him, but he could not read or write. And on top of it all, Leonhard Euler's life is unquestionably marked with his faith in Jesus and his, his Christian ethic. People that write about him are usually not Christians themselves that I have read, but they have to make mention of his faith and devotion to his family when they write about him. There's... Two of my favorite quotes about Euler are that he would, he would, as long as he preserved his eyesight, he would gather his family together every evening and read a chapter of the Bible to them, which he accompanied with an exhortation. And he also, um, it was said, he would do his best work with children, his own children, sitting in his lap or crawling at his feet, which always convicts me because that is that is not how I accomplish. That is not my well. May, maybe time. you should maybe you should like put on a blindfold or something like yeah. that. It might help. I might appre- I probably would appreciate them more. <laughs> so one last question, Dale. I, I want to try to give people just a, a little insight or vision of, of how they should be thinking about this wonderful immaterial world and the beauty in it. So talk a little bit. Uh, pick an area. I put down a couple here like geometry or calculus. Give us some insight that would help us see the kind of things that we can learn and that we can love if we'll devote our mind to wandering around in this wonderful immaterial world of mathematics. I think that those two examples, geometry and calculus, are two of the best ones because of how impactful they have been on the way that we think. Mm -hmm. The way that we think, even the way that we've been talking about mathematics being a a deductive form of truth, truth from truth, Euclid was the first person to ever lay things out that way. Euclid set the stage for deductive thought. And his goal was to not create new mathematics, but to show why all of the mathematics that had been collected by the Greeks at that time was true. And he wanted to demonstrate it starting from as few truths as possible. So if you take the time, and I do recommend that you take the time, especially guided by a good book or a good teacher, take the time to dig into Euclid's elements and see the growth from these five simple truths, Euclid's axioms, which we could name if you wanted to. But from these five simple truths, which you probably have heard of, some of them are 
you can draw a line, you can extend a line, you can draw a circle, and then there's two other ones. From those five simple truths, everything that most people remember about geometry is true because of those five things. So you get a taste of how a very small amount of truth can grow into the huge tree that we call it Euclidean geometry. And then with calculus, again, if you can find a good book or a good video series or a good teacher that can that can tap you into how calculus is the calculus is the study of change, which doesn't sound very exciting at first until you realize that everything around us is constantly changing. We are changing our every time we're moving, we are we are changing, we are growing, we're getting older, the the earth is moving, the sun is rising and setting. And calculus looks at how those things are changing, not over time, but at an instant. How are things changing right now? At this exact instant, how fast is your car moving? And it uses infinity to do that. So infinity is this dangerous concept. Your car is not at infinity, right? Yeah, I mean, my car is not infinity, but in order to calculate exactly how fast my car is moving at an instant, I need to use infinity. So mm -hmm. the, the wonderful power of calculus that Euler was taking advantage of during this golden age of mathematics and that has th been thoroughly explored since then was because mathematicians found a way to think about infinity, bring infinity into the realm of our normal calculations of addition and multiplication. So calculus, we could think of it as the ultimate method of calculation using infinity as its, uh, as its source of power which is a very dangerous thing. So you, you need to be careful when you're doing calculus to <laughs> define things correctly. With infinity in particular, people will ask, it's, it's a fun question to ask people, is infinity a number? No, I would say it's not a number. Not a number. Most people say infinity is a concept. If infinity is a number, and I'm okay saying that infinity is a number, but it's certainly not like any other number that we're used to describing. It's like an eight that fell over. It's like an eight that fell over. It's, and it's not on the number line. Numbers are, we usually think of them as things that we can put on the number line or mm -hmm. maybe things that we can plot on a two-dimensional plane. And you can't do that with infinity. And Newton and Leibniz and then later mathematicians in the 1800s learned a way to using sometimes scary-looking mathematical notation that they created, tap into this the, the truths of infinity that existed in this immaterial world mm. that they could then use to answer questions in all of the sciences. Calculus is, in my opinion, the most powerful and applicable branch of mathematics that there is. Well, and you know, I, I was over in Omnibus, we, we learn about the great books, and there were so many people over history that have just been so impacted by geometry, especially. I think it's Thomas Hobbes that, that basically was trying to, in his book Leviathan, basically do what, what Euclid did with geometry. He was trying to start with the least amount of givens and build a political philosophy. So m many people have just been, just had almost been intoxicated by, by Euclid. They, they've been intoxicated by it, even if they don't know it. Uh, the way that we think and the way that we make arguments is a spinoff of what Euclid did first. Well, and, and is, that, is that maybe one of the reasons why you know, as a classical school, we want people to think critically and logically. But, but in, in so many of the schools in our culture, critical thinking and logical thinking is, is really, outside of the mathematical realm, it's not, it's not even something that they talk about very much. I mean, I, I went through high school, and I don't, certainly didn't learn any logic in high school. I, I probably learned how to think logically in some ways. But, but Euclid is that powerful tool that's, that you can see a master building a system. Like when we, because when you get out to the end of Euclid's postulates, is that the right word? Correct. When you get out to the end of it, it's amazing that he starts with so little and he can learn so much. Right. And, and in a school like Veritas where you have the freedom to explore things like that, not only can you expose them to the truth of Euclid's elements, but you can show them how, how much these great works have influenced the thinking of our entire society. Well, and you can do that and laugh sometimes and be really happy sometimes and even, even be converted sometimes, Correct. I guess.
So, uh, Dale, it's been wonderful talking with you. You've been such a blessing to our school, and thank you for sharing sharing this wonderful, it's not a conversion experience, but maybe an invitation, Mm -hmm. an invitation to conversion, to letting your mind, letting your mind explore this wonderful immaterial world that God has given to us in mathematics. Amen. Thank you for the conversation. You've been listening to Cultivate, the podcast of Veritas Academy, a preschool through 12th grade classical Christian school in Leola, Pennsylvania. If you would like to learn more about Veritas, please visit veritasacademy.com to discover the truth, beauty, and goodness of classical Christian education.